טוב, אז ככה, ערב טוב אפשר להגיד, יום חמישי, לקראת סוף שבוע. אנחנו מנסים כבר די הרבה זמן לעורר פה בשוק הישראלי לא מעט עניין סביב הנושא של ניהול תהליכי הפיתוח בחברות שהן בתחום המדיקל. אנחנו עושים את זה כבר שמונה שנים. האירוע הזה שאנחנו עושים אותו היום זה האירוע הראשון מסודו שאנחנו קוראים לו אוקנוס קפה. כמו שאתם רואים, באמת הבאנו לכם גם קפה וגם קיבוץ טל. ואנחנו נשתדל בשלב הראשון, כנראה כל רבעון, לעשות איזשהו משהו יוצא דופן, כמו ההרצאה של היום, שבאמת תאגד תחתה נושאים שהם מאוד חשובים, שקשה לנו להגיע אליהם באופן רגיל ושוטף, גם אם אנחנו הולכים הרבה לכנסים, יש פה הזדמנות לגבש את הקהילה, הקהילה ה... פיתוח הרי ישראלית רפואית כדי להביא אותם לאיזושהי חשיפה וגם לייצר את החיבור הזה בין האנשים זה יכול להיות גם במקום של משקיעים, יועצים, יזמים, אנשי אבטחת איכות, אנשי פיתוח. אז באמת אנחנו מנסים ב... שהאירועים האלה יאגדו תחתם איזושהי קבוצה מאוד ייחודית. הפעם אנחנו הצלחנו להזמין את אלן מינסק שתכף יבוא ויספר על עצמו מי שקרא את הפרומושן שלי אז, וראה קצת את הרקע של אלן, אני אגיד לך את הגרנט לדבר על עצמך, אבל אין ספק שלאלן, אני שמעתי הרצאה שלו וכל כך ריתקה אותי, נסעתי עד ירושלים לשמוע אותה, כשניגשתי לאלן לאחר מכן ואמרתי לו, שמע, אתה חייב לבוא פה, ויש לי קבוצה של אנשים שאני לא רואה אותה כאן במפגש הזה, ואני חושב שזה חשוב לי שהם ישמעו ויראו, חלקם הם לקוחות שלי, חלקם אנשים שאני פוגש בדרך. אז באמת אנחנו נראה היום הרצאה שבעיניי היא מאוד מאוד מעניינת, קצת להבין את ה-state of mind, איך העבודה מול הרשויות הרגולטוריות בארצות הברית. יש ניואנסים קטנים שאנחנו פשוט לא שמים לב אליהם, ושמים את עצמנו בתוך איזושהי מלכודת שמונעת מאיתנו להתקדם, ואני חושב שלאלה יש הרבה הרבה ניסיון שיכול להיות רלוונטי לנו. מילה שתיים על אופנוס, ואחרי זה אני אבקש מישראל להגיד מילה שתיים. על זה שג'י בנדיבותה נתנה לנו את הפסיליטי הזה ומערכת אותנו, את הלקוחות שלנו ואת האנשים שאנחנו עובדים איתם, תודה רבה ישראל. אבל מילה שתיים עלינו, אני לא הולך לעשות פה איזשהו משהו שיווקי, אבל בכל זאת מי שלא מכיר אותנו או מי ששמע אותנו ושכח, אנחנו בעצם בית תוכנה שהתחיל את המסלול שלו לפני כשמונה שנים, אנחנו בעצם בתוך הנושא הזה שנקרא Development Life Cycle לסופטוור, התפתחנו גם בתחום הרפואה, לקחנו את ה-13485 כאיזשהו מתווה עליון, ויש לנו לממש חלקים מאוד נדבכים, מאוד מרכזיים ב- ב- בתקן הזה, והורדנו את זה לרמה אופרטיבית של מערכת שיכולה לקחת ארגון מכל סדר גודל, מרמה של יזמים של קבוצה קטנה של חמישה עד עשרה אנשים, גם חברות שנמצאות בשלבים יותר מתקדמים ומי שיסתכל באתר שלנו, לא נדבר על הלקוחות שלנו, יכול לראות איזה סוג של לקוחות יש לנו. בעיקרון הרעיון הכללי, מה שמוביל אותנו בקונספציה, הוויז'ן שלנו, זה לקחת רעיון שמתחיל מיזמות ולהוביל אותו הכי מהר, הכי יעיל והכי נכון אל המרקט ולא לשכוח את המרקט. זה הוויז'ן שלנו. אבל בדרך בין הוויז'ן לבין המרקט יש חתיכת דרך ארוכה לעבור ובמדיקל דיווייס היא מאוד מאוד ארוכה, אנחנו רואים את זה בפיקים של השש עד שמונה שנים במחזורי החיים ואנחנו רוצים להביא אתכם מהר ככל האפשר אל ההגשות שלכם ולהוריד את רמת הסיכון בתהליכי האודיט. את זה עושים באמצעות מחשוב של התהליכים והעבודה השוטפת של האנשים. אנחנו דואגים לא רק לדבר עם השוק, אנחנו גם מייצרנים אבל אנחנו גם מיישמים, כלומר אנחנו באמת מרגישים במה שנקרא, ב-first year, מרגישים חזק מאוד את הצרכים שלכם ופועלים על פיהם. אנחנו לא משהו גנרי, אנחנו מאוד tailored לצרכים שלכם, ולכן הבאנו איתנו ביחד לתוך ה-advisory board את מי שבאמת יכול לעזור לנו לראות צעד שתיים קדימה. זה חברי הוועדה של תקן 6601, זה חבר הוועדה של 62304. זה אנשים מתחום של הוורטיקציה והוולידציה, אנשים שאתם מכירים, מאג זאבי, סטלי לוזלן ושרמן איגרס. ואנחנו נמשיך ונביא אלינו פנימה לתוך ה-advisory board את האנשים הטובים ביותר, 
שבעצם ייתנו לנו כחברה שני צעדים קדימה לדעת מה אתם אמורים להתמודד ב-2014, 2015, 2016. Okay? <coughs> החלק השלישי זה בעצם מה שאנחנו עושים, זה לבוא ולהתאים את עצמנו ל... לצרכים שלכם, לבנות את החליפה המתאימה לחברה. מילה אחת על הנושא, לאן אנחנו צועדים קדימה. הרגשנו אחרי שמונה שנים שנושא החתימות האלקטרוניות וה-Document Management System, שלחברות גדולות מן הסתם יש, לחברות קטנות אין, הוא נושא מאוד קריטי ב- ב- בחברות האלה ובתהליכים שלהם, ואנחנו הולכים לתת מענה עד סוף השנה לחתימות אלקטרוניות לפי CFR 21 Part 11, ואנחנו הולכים לתת מערכת DMS. שהיא לא תתחרה במערכות DMS של סאפ, אבל היא תיקח את מה שאתם זקוקים לו ותיתן את המענה המלא לנושא הזה, וזה בזה די סוגר את החורים שנפתחו בתקנים כתוצאה מההתפתחות שלהם בשנים האחרונות. הרעיון הכללי זה גם כן ללכת לאנטרפרייז הגדולים ולקחת את כל תהליכי האיכות שלהם ולהלביש אותם על איזושהי מערכת KPI, זה אנחנו נעשה באמצעות אינטגרציה למערכות DI שאנחנו עובדים איתם. זה היה ככה קצת התרודקשן על מה אנחנו עושים היום, איזה מין מפגש זה, ומילה שתיים על אורקנוס כחברה. אני רוצה להזמין בבקשה את ישראל ציטרון, שבעצם הוא מנהל אבטחת איכות, או לדייק יותר בהגדרה, פה מג'י שמארח אותנו, קצת תספר לנו מילה שתיים מה קורה כאן. טוב, אז קודם כל ברוכים הבאים לאכסניה שלנו. אתם נמצאים באתר של ג'י הסקר, אחד מתוך ארבעה אתרים שיש בישראל. בסך הכל יש פה בישראל למעלה מ-500, קרוב ל-600 איש שעובדים בג'י הסקר. פה בבניין הזה אנחנו מייצגים משהו כמו 160 איש. ייצור ופיתוח, בעיקר אולטרסאונד, אולטרסאונד קרדיאולוגי, שנמכר ב... בסביבות 170 מיליון דולר בשנה, כ-3,500 מערכות. בנוסף לכך יש פה קבוצת פיתוח של CT, של בעיקר תוכנה, וקבוצה קטנה של, של MRI, שבעיקר עוסקת בסלילים. האולטרסאר ביזנס של GE בסך הכל הוא כ-2 מיליון דולר, שמתוכו, כמו שאמרתי, אנחנו נותנים 170 מיליון. והתחום ההתמחות שלנו הוא אולטרסאונד קרדיאולוגי, שמערכות אקו, מיועדות בעיקר לקרדיאולוגים, לא לרדיאולוגים, אבל גם נותנים שירותי רדיאולוגיה ושירותי מה שנקרא Women Health במסגרת המוצר עצמו. כדי לא לקחת את המקום של המרצה, אני אעצור כאן, אני מקווה שתיענו ושתהיה לנו הזדמנות לארח אתכם שוב, אז בשמחה. כדאי לכבות את האור הקדמי ושיראו יותר טוב את ה... לא. כן, את השאר להדליק, גם את האמצעי. עדיף. בסדר ככה? טוב. Um, I want to thank GE for hosting us. Um, I'm a partner in a law firm in the United States, and I've been practicing for 20 years, and all I do is FDA. So we advise medical advice companies, pharmaceutical companies, cosmetic companies, food companies, with anything and everything related to FDA. My firm is about 150 lawyers, and I head up uh, that, uh, the group of nine lawyers who do FDA uh, only. So I could try to speak in Hebrew, but uh, when I get on the meetings and the guy asks me, Um, you know, if I speak Hebrew, I said, he says, I'll talk to you in English. <laughs> so I know more of the Thomas, uh, but I happen to be here for a month with my wife and kids, so hopefully my kids will, you know, they should always exceed that of their parents, so hopefully my kids who go to day school will be able to learn uh, 
uh, and took more seriously maybe than what I should have done when I was in Jewish day school in the United States. Um, I did give this talk in Jerusalem uh, a few months ago, and I've given this talk to uh, universities and to startup <coughs> companies. Um, I recognize that almost all of you have some experience in the medical device industry and FDA, and many of you will have experiences like I said. So I don't have any illusions that I will you know, give pearls of wisdom, some of these things that you may have experienced yourself. There is a lawyer joke that's not very funny, but it's clean, um, where it talks about two people on a hot air balloon, and uh, they're, they're riding and they get lost, and they're not sure where they are. So they happen to see a runner jogging, and they call out to the jogger, and they say, excuse me, can you tell us where we are? Well, the jogger stops and says, you're about 90 feet from the ground. Two people on the hot air balloon, one says to the other one, you know, the jogger was a lawyer. <laughs> How do you know the jogger was a lawyer? Well, the jogger gave clear, concise, and accurate information, but it was completely useless. So I'm hoping that that won't be uh, not the case. It's funny, when I give that joke, and there are in-house lawyers, you know, company lawyers, they don't laugh. Uh, they don't find that as amusing as some people do. Okay, so... Charged enough. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so... I don't want to make this talk too legalistic, and I don't mind if you ask me questions along the way. I know it's a Thursday evening, people are getting ready for Shabbos. I, my wife's picking me up so we can go to Yerushalayim tonight, and apparently there's a Grand Prix race tomorrow yeah. in Jerusalem. So I know. So my wife's already panicking how we're going to get in. The people said, you better come tonight or you're not getting in tomorrow. So I've got a lot on my mind. Um, but um, let me just give you some very, very basics. Of, of, again, you may know some of this, but sometimes it's good to just have some context. Okay? So our Bible, La Havdil, is the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act. That goes back to 1906. It's not a new law. It, there's actually a book in the United States called The Jungle about food packing and Upton Sinclair and about, you know, uh, contaminated food and rats and all these bad things and where was the government regulating food. And from there, we ended up getting the federal, basically what is now uh, the Food and Drug Administration. So, for most of our purposes, whether or not you're pharmaceutical, device, I suspect most companies here are device, but for those of you who may be not device, the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, that's the law. That's the statute. That's Congress. That's not FDA's law. Uh, FDA wrote it. Congress wrote that. Now, FDA fleshes it out by their regulations. And so, if you ever hear CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, that's FDA's interpretation of the statute. So again, Lahavdil maybe is the, if you want to view this as the, as the Torah, as the, as the five books, okay? Um, and then maybe Gomorrah being the oral law and the interpretation. Again, Lahavdil, if I've offended anybody, forgive me in advance. Um, but that was sort of how I might think about it. If you're in the biologic space, like vaccines and serums and toxins and what I call funky medicine, um, that's the Public Health Service Act. But it's all administered by the FDA. So that's where the FDA gets its general rules, okay? It defines what a drug is, it defines what a device is, it talks about contamination, it talks about misbranding, it talks about quality system regulations, it talks about recalls, it talks about inspections, it talks about photographs. Well, it doesn't talk about photographs, that's an interesting issue. FDA thinks they've got the right to take photographs. So there's a lot of things that it talks about than the things it doesn't talk about. And then FDA's regulations, they try to say we, we have a lot of authority, and then every so often the courts say, FDA, you've gone too far. In fact, there's a, there was a famous case in Washington, D.C., and I'm not going to say it exactly the way the judge said it, but basically FDA took a position, and the judge said, FDA, you've, you've given yourself a higher place in the world than you deserve. Okay? Basically, they had said they were more important than they really were, and the judge said, you're not that important, um, or as important as you think. So in order to understand this process of you know, getting the product on the market, staying in compliance, dealing with competitors, life cycle management, all of these various things, you have to understand the law, but also just the internal way that FDA thinks. I mean, if you're, if your companies, most of you will have regulatory affairs people, quality assurance people, and they look at the law, they look at the statute, they look at the regulations. But that's not the only thing that FDA uses when they make decisions. So for example, when you're, if you have a product that's good for review, while the law says if it's safe and effective, or if you're substantially equivalent, but <coughs> what does that mean? 
That's up to the reviewer to decide, is it safe and effective? Well, I've got data that says it's safe and effective. And FDA says, that's nice. We're God. FDA's got three letters, God, you know, got G dash D. But FDA basically says, we're God. We decide if it's safe and effective. We decide if the device is substantially equivalent. We decide. We decide. So you need to understand that concept. And it's not fair, but it's good to be the king. They're not always right, but it's good to be the king. Now you can sue them, you can challenge them, and good luck winning, and you'll probably go, you know, the Tevas of the world can sue. Most companies don't sue. Okay? This is my quick background. And make sure we happen to do, we represent more than two dozen companies in Israel, so, and a lot of early stage companies in the United States, San Francisco, San Diego, Boston, Philadelphia, where they may not be as, in many cases, make sure we're sophisticated, say as a G, that has thousands of people, in each division they've got regulatory affairs people and counsel, etc. A lot of companies aren't <coughs> 10 employees or less. They're virtual or they, okay, so they rely on others. So you have to understand there's the law, and then what I saw, there's the reality. First day in law school, 23 years ago, 24 years ago, the professor said to me, law and justice are not the same thing, okay? And in my office, I have said, et cetera, et cetera, duh. Okay, because I always remind myself, justice is different than law. Okay, and I'm trying to do the right thing, not only tell the client what the law is, but also let's do the right thing. So FDA looks at a lot of different things and you need to understand that. Okay, so the law and the guidance, by the way, there's written guidance. F every so often FDA will issue written guidance. Let's say it's part 11, they may, there may be, there's a part 11 regulation, and then there may be guidance that FDA issues. Oh, and by the way, they withdrew that guidance and then came back to issuing guidance. And then when they have guidance, they always say, first of all, there's draft guidance. Mm -hmm. And then they say, just because the lawyers like to get involved with FDA, oh, and it's not even legally binding on us. It doesn't, this is just words. It's what we're thinking, but don't hold us to it. Mm -hmm. So it's draft, so we haven't even finalized it. There are draft guidances that go back 30 years. They work very quickly. At FDA, it's biblical. Okay, a day, uh, you know, is, is years in FDA. And then there's not legally binding. So there's written guidance, and then there's also informal guidance. When you call up FDA or you're at FDA meetings and they make suggestions, we recommend. Like my wife says, I recommend. <laughs> is it Dorisa? Is it Rabbanan? Okay, in my house, my wife is Dorisa. Okay, it's. She says, she recommends, it requires, okay? Somehow when I recommend to my children, it's a recommendation. When she recommends, it's chok, it's, 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 okay. So, the law can sometimes not be black and white, and it's broad, okay? And it's vague. So, areas that you have to deal with, product development and marketing authorization. Getting your product on the market, whether that's a 510K pre-market notification, uh, PMA, a pre-market approval application, on the drug side, a new drug application, biological license application. So it can be that, but of course that part of that can be good laboratory practices, GLP, or what we call GXP, because it can be good laboratory practice, good clinical practice, good manufacturing <laughs> practices. You've got the applications themselves, you've got the manufacturing controls, you've got part 11, you've got electronic signatures, you've got all the documentation, record keeping, all of these things are all part of pre- and post-market issues. Then on the drug side, you end up having things like exclusivity. That's where you get the big litigations where the Tevas of the world are suing the innovator because that six months can be huge. It can be billions of dollars. Um, I mean, what, what's, what, it was just today it was announced where Sun Pharmaceuticals and I think it was Teva settled with Pfizer for two point some billion dollars having to do with a 10-year-old patent settlement, okay? We're talking real money. So again, you've got product safety issues, efficacy, product quality assurance, and then we've talked about, you typically see GMP, that term on the drug and biologic side, QSR, quality system regulations, is really the same thing, but just on the device side. And then I happen to do a lot of work in the product advertising and promotion area. I mean, I deal with all these things, but a big gray area is at promo, because marketing wants to say how wonderful the product is. Let's take a 510K as an example. If you don't know what a 510K is, it's a pre-market notification. I have substantially equivalent to basically something else in the market. So marketing says, we're unique, we're revolutionary, we're one of a kind. 
And the regulatory is saying, please don't say that. Because if we say that, then FDA says, oh, you are? Give me data. Well, we didn't mean it that way. We're just unique in the marketplace. But for you, FDA, we're just like everybody else. <laughs> and then post-market surveillance. You have to make sure, in some cases, you have to track the device. You have to, there's record keeping, there's documentation, there may be corrective actions, there may be new labeling that's required by FDA or recommended by FDA. So there's a lot of, there's black and white of the law, but then there's gray because the law's not always so clear. If it were clear, I'd be out of a job, and frankly, most of you would be out of a job because it'd be that easy, but it's not that easy. And the other thing to keep in mind is you're dealing with human beings. FDA are, are people, they're not machines. So everyone's got their own personality. I met with a company this morning in Rehobo. It's a drug company. And they happen to be talking about the particular division director of that review division. And I, and I said, what he says goes. Because he said to them, how, do you, how, you know, how should I interpret the fact that the very first thing that the division director, not the reviewer, but the division director, who's ultimately signs off on the, the, the letter, said, I don't think this price is going to work. I said, that ain't good, okay? Because I said, this guy, he makes or breaks companies. Now, you could say that's not fair, but you could also say that's CEOs and CFOs and COOs, okay? People get to have says. I'm an equity partner in my law firm. There are 40 equity partners. I get to have more say than some of my other partners. Animal Farm, George Orwell. Some animals are more equal than others, okay? That society, I tell the associates, get over it. You're paid a lot of money, okay? I can't say it's not fair. I says, when you're 18, you can, talk, you can tell your psychiatrist or psychologist, I wasn't a good father, okay? That's the way it is. <laughs> now, I don't tell them that because I don't want to give them any ideas, but they're going to blame me. Okay? <laughs> so, okay. So, now, these are some of the common mistakes that we see, okay? Now, some of these you're going to say, you've got to be kidding me. And I'm going to tell you, in this case, I don't care. I joke around a lot. I try to make these talks somewhat humorous. It's later in the evening, okay? Uh, I just came from a hobo. I'm tired. Okay, I had 37 meetings at Biomed over two days. We got in Monday afternoon. I haven't seen my kids since Monday. Okay, I'm tired. I'm sure you're tired. Okay, so I try to make this somewhat light, but in this regard, these are things that I have seen in 20 plus years, and these are just some. Underestimating the critical review that FDA brings to product review. They really take their job seriously. They, these, many of these people are lifers at the government agency. The same would be true of the Ministry of Health or any uh, in, the, in Israel, okay? These people in the United States, these people could make probably two, if not three times the amount of money in private industry as a consultant, as a lawyer, as, as industry. But they've chosen to take a government salary. And I can tell you in the United States, you may have heard we have the sequestration issue where basically the government has sort of said we you know, they don't get to travel and they have to take furloughs and things like that. So this, it's a great job because it's a career job. And my father-in-law, blessed memory, was an IRS lawyer. So, you know, he, did, he had a nice living. But it is what, he could have made a lot more money if he decided to join a law firm. These people are scientists, they're reviewers, they're clinicians, and they take it seriously, and they should. I think the number that I heard, and I could be wrong on this, but it's, it's something to the effect of one in four, one in four products that are sold in the United States, or maybe it's 25% of the economy in the United States, is somehow regulated by the FDA. And it's amazing. I mean, we're talking also laser shows, like rock concerts. You know, if you had, I like Pink Floyd, you know, or the Stones, you know, they do a laser. Those lasers, that's actually regulated by FDA. Microwaves, regulated by FDA. Cosmetics, animal feed. What you give your dogs or cats? Over-the-counter drugs. All of these things, tongue depressors. You, you know this. I mean, I'm talking about preaching, preaching to the choir. So they have a lot of responsibility, and they take it seriously. And they don't want to get called before Congress or be on national news that they, that they screwed up. And they regulate thousands, if not millions, probably, in sheer volume of products. So they take it, so people, I think, sometimes say they don't know as much or they're not taking it seriously because they're so far behind. It's not that they want to be behind. They frankly don't have enough money. I'm not an apologist for the agency. But they, frankly, there's a lot more of industry than there is of them. When you look at the Office of Generic Drugs, for example, I think that Teva has like 
500 applications at FDA alone. And that's just, that's just one company. I mean, GM's just got hundreds, or certainly, oh, hundreds, certainly double digits worth of applications at FDA, or that they're working on. Whether that's PMA, Medtronic, J&J, you name it. I know some of the companies here. You have two or three applications at FDA. So, and by the way, people want them to issue guidance. Not only do I want you to review my product, but I'd like you to issue guidance to the industry so I know what to submit. And I want you to answer all of my questions. And I want you to speak at all of my conferences. And I want you to still take the salary you're taking. And I expect you to work 24-7. It's not an easy job. But they do take it seriously. Now, also fail to appreciate that the data requirements to establish safety and eth 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 efficacy. That is, this isn't just, I did a test on 10 people. I, I kid you not, I had a client once, it was a, it was a marketing campaign. And they said, the, the slogan was something to the effect, you know, patients prefer our product. And I said, on what are you basing that? Well, we asked our employees and they liked it. I said, you're kidding me. I said, shame on the person who says, no, they don't prefer their own product. That person was probably escorted out the door, okay? Sample size of us, we like us. We did data. We prepared the protocol. We hired the investigators. It's our drug, it's our device. Guess what? It worked. We must be right. Just ask us. And FDA says, no. You give us the data and we'll review it. We don't self-certify the 510, uh, 510K. You submit an application. There are some areas where you get to self-certify. In some cases with food ingredients, there's a, what they call generally recognized as safe affirmation. But drugs, prescription drugs, you don't say, oh, I've tested it. It's safe. I'll sell it. I dealt with a guy yesterday who wants to sell a prescription drug. He says it's sold in Europe. He insists it works. I'm sure it does. And he says, why can't I sell it in the United States on the internet? Because you don't have approval. But it works, and other countries have approved it. That's wonderful. You can sell it in those countries. What would FDA do to me if I sold it in the United States? They wouldn't be happy. <laughs> but it's safe. I, hey, guys, tell me. I'm telling you, it's safe. I've used the product. It was a migraine product. I have hundreds of thousands of case reports of people using it. This is a hot seller in Romania. That's wonderful. God bless. Sell in Romania. But it's not approved in the United States. Well, that's FDA's fault. Do you see the stupid... And this is a CEO of a drug company, by the way. This isn't just a startup. This guy actually... I won't mention his name. I don't embarrass the guy. But I was shocked, frankly. I was introduced to him, and he's arguing with me about how safe it is. I said, I'm, I'm going to take your word for it. He's like, try it. I said, I'm not going to try it. I don't have a headache. Okay? Now I have a headache, but I didn't have a headache. After talking to you, I have a headache. But I, it's not, you don't self-affirm. There's a lot of requirements. Many times with certain PMA products or new drug application, there can be a thousand patients involved. We even know with 510Ks, they're requiring more and more clinical data with, with class two products. Oh, yeah. They don't want to make a mistake. And the fact that they may have signed off on a product five years ago, ten years ago, is almost irrelevant. The fact that I might have allowed my kid to do something yesterday doesn't mean I don't reserve the right to change my mind now. Or the facts may have changed. FDA did a lot of things ten years ago that they're regretting. There's a lot of 510Ks, for example, that have what we call general use, broad uses. And everyone's marketing under the sun. And FDA says, but that's not what we meant. We thought you were going to sell it for what you told us you were going to sell it. And the company says, well, I told you, but everything, these are all sub-claims that I consider to be covered by the 510K. And FDA says, we didn't think that. And so they're not going after that product, but what they're saying is, your next generation product, you're going to have to give us data. And the company says, but you just signed off on my first generation product five, ten years ago. And FDA said, do you want your product cleared or not? You can make a decision. You can either give us what we want, or you can argue with us. But until you give us what we want, we're not giving you the letter. It's, it's good to be the king. Also, they can, even, yeah. they can give you the letter and then revoke the... They can the rescind the 510K, and it ha it's happened recently. They did it to me once. They, they no, not, not to me personally, but to right. the company I worked for, and we, we, we fixed it, but, but we had like uh, uneasy two months. It's, it's very 
They have the, they believe they have the authority to what they call rescind the 510K. Rarely does it happen. When it's happened, it happened about two months ago, three months ago with a company called ResMed, where there ended up being allegations of fraud and, and FDA, had, FDA signed off on it and then it looked as though there had been political pressure put on it and that they should not have signed off on it. It's extremely rare, but it, it, it can happen. Also, the failure to recognize expense and time commitments. I mean, again, I know to some extent your R&D, RA, QAP, but I, I think you know this, and this is probably more for you to remind your CEOs and CFOs, but I had a client once who said to me, he was the president of a company, and he said, they're going to put me out of business. And he says, you know, there's no room for a small businessman anymore. And I said, you're not selling pencils here. You're selling medical products. In this case, it was a prescription drug. No one said you had to sell prescription drugs. That's the job you chose. And if you want to sell pencils, which is not regulated by FDA, knock yourself out. But pe most people don't get injured by pencils unless the little kids poke themselves because they think it's fun. But most people don't get hurt by lead poisoning by pencils. But they do get hurt if they overdose on prescription drugs or they mix their wrong medications. So yeah, it does cost a lot of money. <clears throat> and that's why companies try to recoup it by charging what they charge. I'm happily married, I say this, I'm, I will be happily married 12 years on June 17th. No gifts, please. Um, happily married. But very one of the first pieces of advice that my father said is, just tell, just tell Julie, my wife, she's right. Okay. In fact, the second date that I went on with my wife, she said, we'll get along if you just accept the principle that I'm always right. And then she said it with a smile. And I said, that's funny. And she goes, I'm not joking. And I told my mother and father that he'd been married, thank God, 53 years. And they said, no, she is right. Okay? So, but it's very common when you're in a discussion. Let's say it's a heated discussion. Let's say it's just a we agree to disagree moment. To not listen. That's human nature. My age is high. I love my wife dearly. But I will admit that I'm not probably the best listener when she's upset. I'm probably thinking... What is she complaining about? I've had a long day. You know, she calls this herself. Whatever. Oh, this guy, I was going to say this isn't recorded, but this is being recorded. You'll delete this part now, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's her name? I will repress the world wide with something else. <laughs> else. Okay. Actually, she's picking me up so you can tell her. Okay. Um, although, she, if she hears about this, she won't pick me up, but i got to get myself to Jerusalem. Okay. But anywho, so what happens is what I call the beautiful baby syndrome. We fall in love with our ideas and our products. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that maybe you're not right. Or maybe you can make something better. I write them, and I've been doing this 20 years. I'm, and I say this modestly, I've been recognized in national magazines for being a decent lawyer, okay? I think I'm a, not a bad lawyer. My mother <laughs> wanted me to say that. I'm not a bad lawyer, okay? Um, <laughs> my wife can cure us. But, but, <laughs> But I write something, and I assume the client understands it. I assume my associate if I, understands it. I make suggestions on a memo. To these, I assume she understands it. I give my handwritten comments to my secretary. Can you make these changes? She says, I can't read your handwriting. What do you mean you can't read my handwriting? She says, I'm becoming more like a doctor the way I write. She says, or, or, or so I, I don't understand what you're getting at. I mean, well, I know what I'm getting at, but I'm not conveying it. A company develops a product. Typically, frequently, the CEO is the founder, scientist, developer, inventor, and they say, this works. I know it works. I literally put my personal, professional credibility on the line. It works. And by the way, I'm trying to help people. I mean, this is not just to make money. They actually want, we want to do good things. That's it's wonderful. You're in the right business. But yet, we can't understand that FDA may actually disagree with us. So the beautiful baby syndrome, which I call us, I have two kids, wonderful kids, Gingies, 10 years old, Matthew, Kayla, Kaya, seven years old, great kids, but they're not perfect. I love them to death, but they're not perfect. Don't let my wife know that, but, I, but she knows I don't think they're perfect. But it's better for me to accept that they're not perfect, because 
if I accept that, then I can help them grow. I can be a better parent. They can become better kids. If I just simply said they're perfect, and the teacher says they need to work on their reading or their writing, or my wife says they got to eat over the plate, or whatever it is, then it's the world's fault. The world is against my kids, because my kids are perfect. And it's a reflection on me. How dare you say I'm a bad parent? My kids are perfect. But I'm not doing anybody a favor. It's for me to say, Matthew, Kayla, you made a mistake, and that's okay. I make a mistake. My father has an expression that makes a thousand decisions in the day. Hopefully most of them are right. So people don't listen. They're so busy thinking of the argument or the challenge, the retort to FDA, the response, that they're not listening. I've seen responses to 510K rejections or to an inspectional observations where basically, it, sometimes it is direct, FDA, you don't know what you're talking about, which is, of course, never a good way to start out a conversation, to they don't answer the question. FDA says you need to do this, and you need to do A, and the company says, and it's blue. The sky is blue. What? <laughs> well, because they're wrong, so I'm just not going to address it. you got to address it. They've raised the question. You may disagree with them. You may explain to them why they're wrong. They may actually have a point, but you can't ignore it. It's not going away. And by the way, they may be doing you a favor. I have I've had several situations where companies have said, they must not understand my product, because they wouldn't have asked such a question. Now, that may be true. It may be that FDA doesn't understand your product, and you will have to educate them. It's also possible that FDA has seen how this movie plays out. They've seen the story. They've read this book. They know what the ending is, and it's not going to be pretty. And so they're trying to tell you, don't make that mistake. They're not your consultants, but they may say, you may want to look at this. Why would I want to look at that? That's not my You may want to look at this, but I don't, that's silly. I I'm just suggesting you may want to, I'm recommending you may want to look at it. And you would be foolish not to look at it. Now, again, they may be wrong. It may be inappropriate, and you can say we looked at it and we decided not to do it. Okay. But they may be giving you free advice. So the failure to listen, whether that's to FDA or, frankly, outside consultants who don't have a horse in the race. I can be more objective about someone else's child than I can be about my child. I can be more objective about my colleague's work than my work. Because I assume that my work is fine. I assume my kids are fine. But if I'm more objective and I listen to people who maybe, I tell my rabbi, don't go to people who agree with you, go to people who disagree with you. Not because they'll dissuade him, but it'll make your argument better. We have a big issue at our show right now about raising the machitza. Okay, well, he goes to all the people who say that he should raise the machitza even higher. We have a machitza. I asked him, is it a kosher machitza? It's a kosher machitza. But he wants it to be higher. So he goes to people and he says, and they say, I'm hearing from members, we should raise the machitza. I says, and I can tell you 15 people who say, don't raise the machitza, the machitza's fine. But he's going to his yes people. So, go to and the I ladies. what's that? Go to the ladies. That's what, <laughs> I, the ladies. I asked the rabbi, go to the ladies. Ask my wife, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but he asked it, his wife, his wife would like it higher. Okay? His, his, well, okay, that's, you don't even know my show politics. Okay, you've got your own show politics, I got my show politics. Okay, not on the board anymore. Okay, so don't discount or ignore FDA's concerns. Again, they may not be right. I'm not suggesting you roll over. I am not suggesting you roll over and do whatever they say. What I am suggesting is at least listen. And if, and if you can't, and if you're not directly involved, then give your opinion. And if you think you're too emotionally invested, ask somebody, either at the company or an outside person, and say, are you reading it the same way? I've been doing this 20 years, and yet I still, when I get certain things, I will run things by a partner or by one of my associates who actually has 15 years less experience than me, and say, how do you read this? There's no harm in getting a second opinion if you're not sure. Good ideas can always be made better. My mother, Jewish mother, I would get a B plus. How can we get an A minus? Okay? And if I got an A minus, how can we get an A? And then when I got graduated Brandeis Summa Cum Laude, she said, you see, I was right. You see, you could get an A. Okay? So I hate it when she's right. Okay? But the point is, a good pro idea can always be made better and more focused. Okay? Fail to understand how FDA will regulate your product. 
people frequently say, well, it's important to look at precedent. It's important to see how they've done others. But your product is what they're going to look at. I have to look at my children. I have to look at my marriage. I have to look at my career. I can't simply say, well, my neighbors are happily married and this is how they do it, so it must be the way I do it. My parents have been married 53 years again, thank God. My parents, I think, have had two nights where they were physically apart. One, if I'm not mistaken, my <coughs> sister was like six years old and apparently had her appendix taken out, so someone had to watch me because she's three years older and I was three years old. So apparently that one time dad was, or mom was with my sister and dad was staying home with me as a three-year-old, and another time dad went to Florida for a business trip, felt so guilty that he was away from the young kids, he drove back that night. Now, that's my parents. God bless them. Joined at the hip. My wife and I, I haven't seen my wife since Monday night. Okay? I travel 30 times a year. Okay? My wife did Peace Corps. She did Semester at Sea. We married later in life. Her attitude is Godspeed. Okay? Good luck. Drive safely. Okay? Okay? Don't even bother to call when you get there. I'll assume no news is good news. Okay? Um, I mean, we love each other, but it's a different dynamic. Okay? So I can look at my parents as an example of how to treat my wife, how to raise kids. I mean, those are all wonderful things to look at. I, I try to take the best of that. But I can't just simply say what works for them will automatically work for me. And my sister, who's older, isn't married. And my wife's parents were married 40 some odd years until my father, blessed memory, passed. And yet, her two siblings aren't married. But they, my in-laws were happily married. So it's, <coughs> who knows why? But we've got to look at, the, at our situation. And I think companies don't focus enough on it. Well, but they treated them this way, so they should treat me this way. Well, if they're treating you unfairly, if they're treating you truly not alike, that is, they're not, there's not a level playing field, that's something you raise with the agency. That's fair to bring outside counsel or consultants or to raise internally with FDA. That's fair. But don't just simply say, well, they did it. That's like saying my son said, well, you know, Donnie's dad allows him to do it. Well, God bless Donnie's dad, okay? But I'm not Donnie's dad. Misconception that, F every, that, F that FDA knows everything. Part of that's FDA's misconception that they know everything, okay? But FDA may not, FDA sees thousands of products. I don't think you understand. They see a lot. Forget the applications that actually get to the point of submission. They're meet, they're pre-IDE meetings. They're pre-IND meetings. They're pre-pre meetings. We represent some Israeli companies and startup companies that get two bites at the apple. They get a free phone call with FDA. We call it the orphan and widow situation. I know nothing, please, 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 I don't know how to speak English. Okay? And we milk that. Okay? And FDA's like, oh well, you know, we feel badly, okay, we'll give you 30 minutes, okay? And they give you free advice. Okay? They'll give you a free phone call. So they are constantly busy. So you may have to educate them, particularly some of the headier technologies. They just can't know everything. They can't look at your application, review all of the literature, go to all of the meetings. Again, you know, you know everything about your industry or your product that it can be. Okay? Rami knows everything there is about the products they sell. But that's not to say that FDA can know as much as Rami knows about his own product. I can't know my 100 150 semi clients' products as well as they know. They can tell it to, but I can't understand it as well as they do. They live and breathe it. So there may be situations where you're going to have to educate FDA. And FDA has a lot of turnover. There's a lot of new personnel. If you've gone to an FDA meeting, I suspect many of you have gone to meetings where there was maybe five of you and there were 20 of them. Literally, there were front row and back row. Okay? There are people who say nothing but take notes. There are people who it's, they're learning on your dime. There are people who are there who have not read anything about your application, but just they're going to an FDA meeting, and there's only five people. Typically, there's going to be two to one, if not three to one of them, to you. And they do that for a purpose. One is it's an educational opportunity. It's also, they'll say they want to make sure they got the right people on there. But there's a lot of turnover. So even if you thought you had a reviewer who understood it, if he or she leaves, well, you got a new reviewer. And you say, that's not fair. And they say, get over it. There's also a misconception that FDA doesn't know more or have experience with the type of product. That is, there's some thought that FDA doesn't that FDA doesn't know enough when they actually have access to a lot. They have seen a lot. The beautiful baby syndrome, FDA has seen a lot of babies. 
And by the way, not all babies are pretty. FDA's seen a lot of babies. So they've seen your type of product. They may not have seen your exact product. But there's a good chance, unless it's a PMA, first of its kind, and even then, they've probably seen a product like it. It's just a PMA because there's not something that's substantially equivalent. Rarely does something come to FDA as a, my God, we have never, ever, ever experienced something like this. My God, we had no idea that such a thing was possible. Rarely does that moment happen. Maybe once in a blue moon. They've seen something like it. So they, and they've got access to other government agencies' databases. So NIH, CDC, regulatory bodies in other countries may talk to them. They've got access to a lot. So they've seen not only your application, but other applications. And many of the people are very experienced. There's some really good people at FDA. So they may be doing you a favor with the question. So I would always, don't discount a question. That's a common mistake that we see companies do. Again, they may not be right, they may be off target, but at least think of the question. Does it possibly have merit? And if it doesn't have merit, at least <laughs> explain to them respectfully, I've thought of your concern, and here's how I'm addressing your concern. There's a misconception that all beneficial products are approved for marketing. It would be nice if FDA approved or cleared every product that was safe and effective or substantially equivalent. We would be a better world for it. But it would also be a wonderful world if every product got proper funding and every company got proper funding so that these companies could be developed. But it just doesn't happen. I mean, I'm amazed, unfortunately, at how many companies I meet early stage where the product seems great, but the company just folds it on the money. That's a shame, but that's reality. So FDA may not sign off on every product. While the legal standard is supposed to be safe and effective, many times FDA says, I think, doesn't say it literally, but I think thinks, there's 10 products on the market like this already. Why should I stick my neck out for an 11th product? What's the benefit? You say, but that's not the standard, and FDA says, well, we're not saying that officially. But if there's more risk to us than benefit, and we already know the nine products on the market, or the 10 products on the market, what's it to? The public is served. We're not denying the public 10 or 11 products. We're just not giving them a 12th or 13th product. There's a misconception that FDA will act as a consultant, particularly during inspections. I think unlike, say, in Europe, where frequently the, the investigators, the inspectors, will give advice. And you will get some FDA errors, particularly people who've been there 20, 30 years who will give you some free advice. But many of the new people say, I don't know what to do. It's not for me to tell you what to do. In fact, now it's becoming harder and harder to even get phone calls with reviewers. Where you have situations where you have to email your request or put it in writing. And then when you get a response by an email, there's four people from FDA on the email string. There's a lot of what we call CYA, covering a certain body part. Okay? They, there's also a misconception that FDA is going to act objectively. They're human beings. It would be nice. It would be appropriate. But if our government agency acted responsibly. Okay, I was a politics major, I was naive. Okay, my wife worked for Peace Corps. We all, we're, you know, probably liberal Democrats in the political scheme. But I'm also practical enough that, you know, life sucks, okay? At times you don't always get what you want. Quote Mick Jagger, okay, in the Stones, okay? Um, misconception that FDA will give smaller companies a pass because, well, we're small. We don't have money. FDA doesn't have in the law or doesn't have any guidance, we feel badly for you. We'll let you go. You seem like a nice guy. <laughs> True story. I played basketball for my yeshiva, and we were horrible. I mean, not, not just bad. We were, let me tell you first of school, just to give you the dynamic here. There were 85 kids in the whole school, boys and girls. If you showed up for practice for the first you were on the team. <laughs> As you got older, you got to start. So by my 11th grade, yours truly was starting for his high school basketball team. Now that sounds pretty good. I started for my, I started for my high school basketball team. Then, talk about false or misleading. Now if I give you the facts, okay, it was Yeshiva. And the Sunday Yeshivas are good. I, I've been told the Sunday Yeshiva basketball teams are good. We were one of them, okay? And, Okay, so we had, you know, 
I don't even, we didn't even have 11 guys. I think we had like eight or nine, okay? Um, so, this is a true story. So we're, we're, we're horrible. I think we lost every game. We typically would play Christian type public school, uh, private schools. And I don't mean this to sound harsh, but it's important to the story. My wife thinks sometimes my stories may be offensive. This is not intended to be offensive. Um, mm -hmm. So we were losing by 30 or 40. There happened to be, a, you always knew when a kid on the other team scored the very first time, if you've ever had this, all of a sudden it's this big, yay! Okay, it was like, oh, it must have been Heim's first basket ever, okay? You know, um, and thank God we could get him that memory, okay? So we're playing this team, and this is the sad part. There was a child who had a deformed leg. I mean, that it was clearly noticeably different, okay? You could tell the kid never started, he probably never played. He scores twice. He goes around one of the guys for a layup twice, okay? And I said to RIA, what are you doing? He goes, I felt bad, we're losing by 40. What, what are you doing? He goes, I felt badly for him, okay? Now, he had Rochmanis on him, okay? RIA will have a place in the, you know, should have a place in the world to come after his 120 years, but, he gave the guy a pass, okay? He felt badly for him. And then it was like, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, you don't get a pass with FBA. You Small companies sometimes get a first bite of the apple. I will say that Israelis, non-Americans, will sometimes get a free bite, a free opportunity. Even if you speak the Queen's English, I would play up. I don't know how to speak English, okay. It's not my first language, okay. Um, you know, it's not, um, oh, I've been in Israel, you know, I can speak it. This is not the time to show them how good your English is, okay? Um, and I'm not being facetious or trying to be silly, but there is a time where you sort of play that, and I call them, listen, I got a company, first time, they've never dealt with FDA before, you know, they don't, like, they'd like to meet with y'all, at least have a 15 minute call. You know, I know you're busy, but, they don't even know how to spell FDA, okay? Can you just, and okay, and they'll say, oh, all right, you know, we'll give you 15 minutes, okay? Um, they're not gonna give bigger companies that break, but, but that being said, they're not gonna sign off on the product. They're not gonna, they're not gonna look the other way with the data, well, because the kid's got a, a shorter leg, okay? Um, I'm sorry, okay, you know, the kid, he's a nice kid, okay, but he doesn't, but, but he's not going to make the NBA, okay? Maccabi's not going to say, well, he's a cute kid, we'll let him play, okay? They're going to say, well, he's a nice kid. I'm glad he had his moment, you know, 30 years ago. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, the misconception that FDA will meet its deadline. It's amazing that FDA will say, we want to hear back from you yesterday. And then if you say, can I hear back, when can I hear back from you, we'll get back to you. Well, you know, we're very busy people. It's the summer months and everyone's in Rehoboth or Dewey Beach, which is in Maryland or, or Delaware. Um, so they're dead, now even, and by the way, you know that on the device site and the drug site, they're user fees, which means you pay them money so that they can hire more reviewers so they can meet deadlines. And guess what? They missed the deadline. <laughs> it's good to be the king. Now, they may not get their money, but what they do is they come in and they say frequently, well, it's not that we missed the deadline, you gave us new information. So the clock started all over again. You miss you you send it to Mr. Smith and he's Dr. Smith and well, we got to send the application back to you. You're kidding me. Well, it's unfortunate, but but we'll get to it. The clock starts over, but we'll look at it again. They'll make any and all excuses to not say that they're wrong. It's good to be king. So, it's not fair. It is what it is. Also. I've only seen once, and I saw this about a year ago, where FDA in writing said, we have made a mistake with a product. They, they, it was a the question, was it a drug, was it a device? Apparently the company had gotten screwed back and forth, back to, you know, was it a drug, was it a device, was it a drug, device? Years go by, and finally FDA acknowledges, we made a mistake. Not, I'm not talking about illegalities, I'm not talking about fraud, but simply, we goofed. I had to show it to my partner, so I said, I've never seen a letter of this this blatant, and they basically said, we goofed, resubmitted, and in essence, we will make sure it gets expedited review. I've never seen anything like it, but it's extremely rare that FDA makes a mistake. It's always new information came to light. You gave us certain information that we didn't have before. Oh, when we met with you, we, we had, you had indicated to us X. 
when you clearly didn't say it. That's what we heard. So it's even when they miss the deadline, you'll see those that are publicly traded, on the, particularly on the drug side, they'll say, uh, FDA's extended our Padupa date, our, our user fee date, and we've agreed. You agree, because you have no choice. You can either get a rejection then and there, or you get it at the end of the three months. But FDA, it's not FDA's fault. We've agreed to give FDA this time. In communications in the clinical trial state. Be a healthy skeptic. You have to know the warts, the skeletons, the problems with your product. If you know the regulatory and safety concerns in advance, you can proactively plan rather than react. I dealt with a company this morning where they were talking about they knew certain issues, they knew that it might come up, they weren't prepared. Sure enough, like a pop quiz, you know, the teacher asks you the one question you didn't study. Your mazel, they ask that question. So you've got to know, this goes back to the beautiful baby syndrome. You've got to know, you don't, by the way, FDA's not expecting perfection. When I took the bar exam, we would, you could, you could study for it and it would be a sort of a for-profit, you know, like training program. And I remember this vividly, it's, it's it gotta be 25 years, okay? No, maybe, well, yeah, maybe 25 years now. Um, and there was a guy from USC, University of Southern California. I remember this like it was yesterday. He reminded me of Rabbi Estoff, or when my machine teaches. And Charles Whitebread was his name. And he says the, the, the bar exam, and he screams into it, because Rabbi Estoff would say, everywhere is like precious diamonds and rubies, okay? They're not, they're not arguing because they hate each other, because they love each other. That was Rabbi Estoff, okay? Hillel and Shammai, Rabbi Shmuel, okay? So Charles Whitebread, not a Jewish guy, basically said, it's a pass fail exam. You can't know everything. Basically, you're going to make yourself nuts with the bar exam. I had to know 18 fields of law in a two-day exam. And they were only going to quiz me on maybe four or five. But the idea is I had to be prepared. So the point is, I could make myself trying to get 100%, or I could basically go for the whatever it was, 70%, 80% that I needed. So focus on that. So the point that I'm getting at, and I'm telling stories just to try to make it a little bit light, is you can't know everything, you can't plan for everything, but that which you can know, that which you know is there, don't hide it. And no one wants to be the guy who raises their hand and says we have a problem. That's unfortunately the role of many of you, okay? But I'm on my kid's school board, okay? I happen to be the only lawyer on the board, and I'm and when they talk about we want to build a new whatever, we want to have a new this, and I'm like, excuse me, we have no money. Well, that's not really that important. Well, actually it is. I mean, we're a board of trustees. We can't spend money that we don't have. You see, that's a problem. So the point is, you got to sometimes be the person who raises their hand. Risk minimization and risk management. Listen carefully to FDA, even if it sounds like the information provided is odd. They may be doing you a favor. By the way, this handout, I told Rami, I have no problem if he wants to give you all the handout. I, so if he wants to email it to you or whatever, I, I have no problem with that. Um, or I can give you a copy by email. So as much as you can get into FDA's head and do the homework, the better off you'll be. By looking at precedent, by hiring, I'm not, this is not to uh, hiring lawyers, but <coughs> just hiring anybody outside assistance, okay, who might have some experience in that area. What have they done with similar products, what we call precedent? Evaluate what were the safety issues that those products faced. Because FDA is going to look at that. And you're going to say, but that wasn't my product. And FDA is going to say, but it's your type of product. Shy away from, again, this novelty, revolutionary marketing claims. And again, engage consultants who are familiar with your review division. There's a, consultants and lawyers are a dime a dozen. There are a lot of them out there. So the fact that the person can say, I worked in the device industry for 30 years in ophthalmics, is nice, but is irrelevant if we're talking about cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular problem. That may be that they know how to write a 510K. That may be that they know how to spell FDA. But it's too therapeutic areas. Someone can say, I have all kinds of experience with solid oil dosage foreign products. That's nice. But I'm talking about a liquid product. So make sure you get the right people who can help you understand what may be going on. Accept the fact that the central focus of human clinical investigations is the protection of human sectors. That's FDA's bottom line. So when in doubt, FDA is going to err on the side of being conservative. If there's a discrepancy during a clinical trial audit, 
if there's a discrepancy with the data, there's a variation in the enrollment, they're going to think the worst, or at least ask questions. And so if you see that there's been a deviation, if you see that the investigator did something out of the ordinary, if you see that you may have inadvertently cut corners, you need to deal with that now. You may even have an obligation to notify FDA. Poor communications with clinical investigators can result in poor outcomes with FDA. Non-compliance can lead to FDA action like a clinical hold, refusal to accept data to support a marketing application, loss of credibility, which is an intangible, which is very difficult to quantify to the CEO, but basically, if you have a bad reputation with the agency, you're, you've lost probably five years. You know, there was the, I, I told you about my star high school basketball skills. Well, at the time that I played, Michael Jordan, if you know anything about basketball, Michael Jordan was the player. He was, and he would always make a move, and he would always walk, he would always do things that none of us were allowed to do, but he was Michael Jordan, so he got away with it. So I would make the same moves, or try to make the same moves. I always got called for the violations, and I would ask my father, why does Michael Jordan get away with it? And my father says, because you're not Michael Jordan. You're the guy who plays on that high school basketball, that you basketball team, okay? I didn't get the break. You have a good reputation with FDA. FDA will work with you. They may not give you all you want, but they will work with you. If they don't believe you, don't even bother. They can, you can say the sky is blue, it is sunny outside, okay? There's not a cloud in the sky, and they will say, I think I see a cloud of it if they don't believe you. But if it's gray, they'll say, well, I can see why you think it's sun. That's human nature. That's business. And that's no different than FDA. There could be enforcement actions such as a warning letter. There could be other delays and more questions with the application or with the company. Meeting with FDA about your study. By reviewing FDA requirements, guidelines, precedents, knowing your review division, recognizing the likely FDA expectations, you can try to control your message and your priorities. Again, they run the show. But as much as you can control the one hour meeting you might have, or the 30 minute phone call that you might get, the better off you will be. Again, FDA may want to use your product as a learning opportunity for others. FDA may have a preconceived notion. I know certain directors who have certain preconceived notions that certain types of products will not work. They believe that they've seen enough product and enough data that certain products, certain therapies, are just not going to work. And they will tell you in the first meeting, I don't think it's going to work. The company I met with this morning, when he said, the division director said, first thing he said is, I don't think this product is going to make it. That's not a good sign, but he said, but I want to listen. But he has a, he was very honest. I have a preconceived notion. You're, not only, you, you have to, I'm telling you, I don't think you're going to be able to do it. At least the way you have proposed. I'm not saying you won't ever get this done, but I'm telling you, what you <coughs> said to me, I don't see it happen. You're going to have to deal with that. Share with FDA how you plan to use any foreign data. I know a lot of companies that do, in Israel, who obviously use the Israeli hospitals, because they're great hospitals. It's cheaper outside the United States to do trials. A lot of companies do it in Eastern Europe. It's cheaper. They may be able to get certain patients. There may be certain demographic reasons. I appreciate all the various reasons. And the law allows for FDA to accept foreign data. But you will be foolish if you think that FDA will accept 100% foreign data. At a minimum, they're going to want 10 patients, 20 patients, just so they can check the box. I met with a company yesterday that said they had 600 patients in the study and they wanted to use about a quarter in, from Israel. And FDA said, no, it's going to have to be all American, okay? Because they said for demographic reasons, based on the therapeutic area, F FDA was saying all patients, will, all subjects will have to be in the United States. And the client's like, but I thought we were allowed to use foreign data. And FDA says, well, you're allowed to, but we're just not going to accept it this time. <laughs> <laughs> you can do what you want, you're just not going to get approved. You can drive, I'm just not going to give you the keys to the car. Uh, do you see any thing here? The question was, have I heard anything about FDA not accepting data from this one? I think that would be too general of a statement, honestly. I think that if it's good data, it's good data. I don't think that FDA, in my opinion, I don't think FDA has a preconceived notion, oh, it's from Israel, therefore we won't accept it. I do think I will say this uh, carefully, because I'm being recorded. Um, I love you, dear. Um, that's not my wife. Um, not to Ronnie. I don't know Ronnie. Um, is 
with sort of Chinese data, like Chinese quality issues, India, Malaysia. There are certain countries when it comes to quality related functions, FDA will tell you they have concerns. They won't identify it by country, but they will say that there are certain countries to which they have concerns. I have not heard FDA, certainly FDA would never publicly state that they've got a concern with this one. I think it wouldn't shock me if they felt that certain companies may rely too much on Israeli data. They may be over. I think what I might say is true is that I think Israeli companies may give too much credence or importance to Israeli data. Meaning, Israel data is excellent. It's great universities. They're great clin you know, clinical investigators, smart people. And so I think that there may be a perception. I'm not, I don't know that this is what FDA is saying, but I'll tell you what I'm, I'm just giving my two cents, is that sometimes we are the gold standard, so FDA should accept the gold standard. And I think FDA says, no, we're the gold standard. We in the US are the gold standard. So I'm not going to I'm not going to attribute to Israel. What I would say is I think there are some ex-U.S. companies that say our country's rules, our country's data is just as good as yours, FDA. So you should accept it because it's equal to. And I think FDA sometimes will push back and say maybe equal, but certainly not better. Um, I don't. The truth is I. When you look at monthly clearance letters on five ten. You see, Israeli, you, you know, I mean, obviously, American companies are probably the number one companies that, you know, number one country. But, you know, Germany, Israel, China, I mean, you still see a lot of Israeli companies getting clear. There are not as many Israeli drug companies, frankly, but also the Israeli drug model, in my experience, is typically not to take it all the way to fruition. Protalix gives the rights over to Pfizer. Teva is the exception for that, it's typically generic drugs. But you don't see many of the biotech companies going all the way through. But I have seen the Israeli device companies getting their products clear. Yeah, that's not good. What are talking about the data itself, or clinical data? Right, and I, I think and I did answer, which is that. Specifically about the uh, using of Israeli patients. Right. And the bias. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, mm -hmm. I think I did answer, which is I don't think they do have the bias. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think that what I've said, and I'll say it again, is I think that FDA doesn't like when any country, uh, ex-U.S. company, says in our, our country's data is just as good as the U.S., so you should accept it as the, it is that. That, I think, is more an appropriate statement than I think they have a bias. Now, I'm not going to tell you there's not a reviewer who may be biased against us or who may have some political agenda or whatever, but, but I, don't, I, I think, in my experience, many of the reviewers I do deal with actually find Israel puts out pretty good products, and, and the data is typically very good, and they're, so they know what they're doing. So I've not seen that. I'm not saying that you haven't heard it, and again, I'm not going to say that there's not a reviewer who doesn't believe that. I would, I would spin it more that I think, I, where I have seen FDA say, where the companies put too much credence to the foreign data, as though it should be accepted in lieu of U.S. data. And I think FDA doesn't like that mentality. I think they like foreign data as part of a package, but I don't think that they like it as exclusively that's what I would say. Does that answer? I mean, is that a better? Yeah. Well, does it, not that you, you don't like my answer, but does that answer? <laughs> but I mean, if I answered the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, okay. How the game plan? Know the difference between an agency requirement versus a guideline or request. Again, the shall versus a should. Is it should? Is it shall? And is should really shall? We recommend. Is that recommend? We strongly recommend. We had a client once, now actually, who was told about three or four years ago, you will need to do, we recommend you do something. They got a letter as part of response to something else. An unsolicited FDA said, by the way, we are going to remind you that we recommend. It wasn't even part of the original questions. But FDA obviously was saying, we haven't seen the company respond really the way we want. So we're sort of giving you another polite reminder. And the company wants to, challenge them on it, and I'm like, you can challenge them, but they're pretty clear. Do you think there's any way to change their opinion? Well, fine. I mean, you can try, but they've told you twice what they believe. I've had other situations where they've said that twice, and the company said, I had no idea that FDA believed that. Did you not read the letter? They said, we recommend. Now, again, recommend doesn't mean you have to, but we had no idea that this was of concern to FDA. What did you think what they wrote? We, we have concerns about. 
we have concerns about means something. We, are, we haven't seen something. That's where they, they, they fell in love with their product. That's where they weren't being honest with themselves. That's when they weren't really listening and reviewing what FDA said. That's when they overlooked and said FDA is wrong. Or they knew FDA was right, but they were afraid that it was going to delay the process. So we hope this will go away. Well, these rarely go away. No when, okay, so understand why is FDA asking so you can respond effectively? Understand the question. I mean, I say this respectfully, my friend, you didn't think I, was, I understood your question because you said, I don't know if the words came out, that's not what I asked, okay? So I thought I did understand your question, but I didn't articulate it well, right? Not, not well enough, so I had to hear it again, you asked it again, but I have to understand why you're asking the question. And then I tried to give you, you know, an answer. So I can respond more effectively if I listen to the person and try to hear why, what they're asking. I also tried to understand why he was asking, not only the words that the gentleman was asking, but why you were asking, okay? So know when and how to push back. Pick your battles carefully, keep emotion out of it. So you may not like eight things. Are you really gonna challenge FDA on eight things? If you're in business, are you gonna challenge your boss or your colleague on eight things out of 10? Or are you gonna probably say, let me pick the one or two. I gotta pick and choose my battles with my kids, I gotta pick and choose my battles with my wife, with my partnership. I have a marketing budget. I come to Israel three times a year. If, they, if I say, I wanna go to London, they say, well, Alan, you decide. You got a marketing budget. You said you wanted to go to Israel three times a year, now you want to go to London. You decide, you either got to take out an Israel trip, or you got to, or you're not going to London. Or you're going to have to, or it'll come out of your personal pocket. You make the decision. So I have to pick and choose my battles, keep emotion out of it, consult with advisors, again, open it and honest. You, a meeting I had, again, not to keep going with more examples, but I think it's important. This morning I met with someone, they wanted to ask me a question, they asked the question, and the person said, uh, we probably should tell Alan a little bit more. And I says, well, if you want an honest answer, yeah, okay? I was with a company, an Israeli company, device company in March, and they were asking me, a, a, basically it was an off-label question, <laughs> okay, can we promote the product off-label? And the CEO was saying, you know, well, let me tell you the facts, okay? And he starts telling me the facts, and then the regulatory guy says, well, wait a second, I think we need to tell them this, and the CEO is saying, no, that's not relevant. And then the medical guy said, well, but I think Al needs to know this, and the regulatory guy says, well, that's not exactly right. And I said, you know what, why don't y'all come up with the question? Agree to what the question is, and then ask me the question. But my answer will change as you give me new facts. But I can't help you if you don't give me all the facts. Similarly with FDA, FDA has the easy out. Frankly, they want an easy out when they're behind, so don't give them an easy out, by not giving them a complete answer or a complete package. Don't make that the excuse. That's easy for FDA to say, it wasn't us, it's you. You gave them a reason to delay things, to ask things. The more you can be unemotional, the more you can be honest, the more you can say, I know what your, in essence, I know what your concerns are FDA, and here's how I'm gonna address it. You don't have to say it quite that literally, but in essence, I know what you're thinking, and here's how I'm gonna deal with it. I know what the safety issues are, and here's how I'm dealing with it. I know what the quality <coughs> issues are, and here's how I'm dealing with it. I know that I'm not exactly substantially equivalent in all senses of the world, but here's how I'm dealing with it. What you're doing is you're saying, I know what you're thinking, and I'm going to get you out of whatever box, and I'm going to preempt you from saying no to me, because I'm going to address as much as I can control. Now, they may disagree with me, but at least I've told FDA, I'm a legitimate person here. I, I know what I'm doing, and I'm not going to give you an easy out here. You're going to have to come back to me with a legitimate reason why not. And then it becomes an important, a, a good dialogue. You've established credibility. What you've told FDA is, I know you've got a job to do. I know the public health is a concern. I'm not trying to just make money here. I'm trying to do the right thing too. And I've thought about this carefully. I'm not going to cut corners. I've looked at what you've done in the past. I know what your concerns are. And I, want the same, I have the same concerns you do. And here's how we're going to address it. <coughs> I'm gonna, whatever box you might get yourself into, I'm gonna get you out of it. That's how you work with FDA for the moment. Show preparedness and familiarity with the regulatory process, your product and similar products. Again, this gets back to credibility. May be able to allow existing data to avoid reinventing the wheel. Again, that's the whole concept of substantial equivalence. 
It may be, again, with the foreign data. If it's a 505B2 new drug application, there may be a way that you could say, FDA, let's not reinvent the wheel. Again, what you're doing FDA to FDA is you're saying, you've looked at this before. I'm not making you think too hard. One of the worst things you can do to FDA is make them think too hard. They're not good at thinking outside the box. They will if they love the product. If they love the product and there's nothing like it, they, they will find a way to work with you, whether you're a small company or you're a big big company. Okay? There's, you know, there's a company in the room that came up with a pretty funky product that many of us would think, well, that was pretty novel. And FDA wanted to find a way to get that product on the market. And they did. They worked with the company. So Another avenue, of, another, avenue, another avenue to downsizing and eliminating additional trials is to examine existing data. A way to keep costs down is, again, to try to figure out what FDA has already looked at. FDA, I'm just asking you to do what you've done before, before, before. Not what you did 20 years ago. That's typically not a good, that's not a good trend. You really have to look at what have they looked, said in the last two to three years, whether that's a 510K, whether that's clinical data, whether that's guidance, what have you. The here and now is what you need to be looking at. It may be possible to find answers within the sponsor's own data, another sponsor's data, or the published literature. Utilizing the full potential data that have already been collected might help to drive down costs and negate the need for additional clinical sessions. Now, certainly if FDA says no, or maybe, or it depends, your initial reaction will be, they're wrong. Such as a proposed study design, <coughs> what have you. But you really do need to kind of bite your tongue and say, might they have a point? Now, if they don't have a point, you push back, you try to figure out what the concerns are. Again, FDA, what are your concerns so I can better address it? But they might have a point, and you might be choosing the wrong battle too early. So don't roll over, but also be willing to listen and be open to criticism and suggestions, because ultimately FDA runs that ship. You want to have a clear understanding of FDA's expectations and as much as possible agency line. So in the enforcement context, so that was sort of in the development, clinical, pre-approval scenario. In the enforcement context, you want to have a response team. You want to look at FDA's correspondence for accuracy. Are they right on the facts? Because sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they misunderstood the facts. So are they right on the facts? Have they given you a complete picture of what went wrong? Submit a timely response. It's typically you want to do 15 working days or 15 business days. Where you disagree with the investigator, this is not the opportunity to take a pot shot at him or her. You can you conviction moan to your lawyer. You conviction moan internally. You can if they were unprofessional, if they were racist, anti-Semitic, sexist, whatever. That's fair to bring up to the agency. But simply, I didn't like their conclusion. That doesn't make them an anti-Semite. That doesn't make them a racist. It doesn't make them a sexist. Means they, they disagree with you. Smart people can agree to disagree. So if you do disagree, you can find a way that if they say you didn't provide certain documentation. Well, I did provide documentation. Maybe they didn't understand that that was the documentation. So there's ways to say, you know, the company did not have certain records available. Well, wait, we did have the records available. You just, it was either they were available in you didn't ask for it, or they were available and we gave you, we were too late in getting it to you, or whatever. But you, you, I think it's fair to try to clear up the record because the response is going to senior people, not just the person, the investigator, but you do want other people reviewing it to know the full story. Because all the story they know is their side, or at least the investigator's side. So it is fair to try to clear the record, but don't take pot shots at their personality. Respond quickly to agency requests. State the agency companies clearly, you know, uh, committed to compliance. Uh, senior management is involved. There's certain boilerplate type languages that we all know to say. Also, be specific with your corrective action. Don't simply say we will respond promptly. A common mistake I see companies make is they say we'll fix everything in a week or two. And there's 15 observations, and the response is we'll fix everything tomorrow. It's just not going to happen. So either A, you're lying, or B, you have no idea of how long it's really going to take you. Either way, you don't look good with the agency. So when FDA, for example, issues a 483, they go in the line of importance. You know, lack of a quality unit is typically going to be top than paint chips in the bathroom. So you might as well start the first one and focus on the first, second, and third options and have a game plan. We're going to 
you know, our plan is to try to address these in two weeks, three weeks. We'll go on to the others in another three weeks, or whatever. As long as FDA sees that there's a game plan with specifics and that there is an end in sight, where I have seen FDA not be happy is they said, we didn't see specific, a specific plan. Basically, what we heard was platitudes. We want to work with you. We want to do right by you, FDA. We want to get out of the doghouse. But we're not, we don't really know how to get out of the doghouse, but we want to work with you. And FDA says, work with us by telling us what you're going to do. You tell us what you'll do. If we like it, we'll get, get, get you out of the doghouse. Check you at the door. I once reviewed a 483 response where I made a lot of comments, and I suggested to the, per, to the director of QA, it's not a bad response, but I'm afraid you're not seeing the big picture. You know, the toothpaste cap, silly example, but toothpaste cap is off the bottom, uh, the, the, the toothpaste. So our response is we put the toothpaste cap back on. All right, now, that's an answer. But the bigger question is, why was it off to begin with? Are there other bottles that might not have the caps? And now we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. FD wants you to deal with the specific issue, but bigger, well, make sure it doesn't happen again. And could this be an issue beyond the specific product? So I had made the comment that I'm afraid you're not seeing the big picture. The company gets a warning letter. I kid you not, we're afraid you're not seeing, that you don't see the big picture. The CEO asked me, did he run it by you? And I said, well, he did. I'm not trying to get, I wasn't trying to get the director in trouble. Well, he did, and I gave him my comments. Well, what were your, can I see your comments? And I sent him comments, and my comments were, I'm afraid, not seeing the big picture. And he goes to the guy, why didn't you make the change? Now, he doesn't have to accept my changes. I'm an outside advisor, you can take or leave my comments. But basically, the guy took it personally. First of all, he was, it was on his call, on his watch, that the company got the 483, so he was defensive to begin with. And now he's going to have an outside person tell him how to do his job better. And he didn't want to hear that. And probably he didn't know how to deal with the bigger issues, so he didn't take my advice. That's his prerogative. But he, he didn't shake his ego at the door. Arrogance is a major turnoff. And again, these are things with FDA. These are things in business. Okay, You go to a meeting, and there's a person who seems to always be the know-it-all. That's the, that's the, the, the turnoff. Issue information to important constituents as soon as possible. If FDA is doing a clinical hold, if FDA is doing an inspection, if the 510K is going to be delayed, it's important to let everyone know this so that they can respond. Because if you want help, particularly if you're a multinational company or you have, you're an Israeli company that has a subsidiary in, uh, or an office in the United States or elsewhere, why not share information collectively? I remember talking to a multinational company and I asked them, and they, a number of the sites had received 483s. And I said, I'm just curious, do you share the 483 and the 43 responses with the other sites? And the guy's answer was, well, why would we do that? Well, because you're kind of a family, and you know, you really should share this, you can learn. And his response was, but it's kind of embarrassing. Why would I want to share? It's like, in essence, it's my dirty laundry. It's like a family secret that I'm sharing here. Well, first of all, 43s are a matter of public record eventually. But by the way, I would hope that if I'm in Baltimore, and I have, and my, my, my counter office in Haifa just got a letter looking at certain things. I would hope that Haifa would contact Baltimore or Baltimore would contact Haifa because inevitably if it's a bad inspection, they're going to go to the other side anyway. And no, it's no longer about me, it's about the company. Because if there's smoke, there may be fire. And by the way, I can learn from the mistakes of the guy in Baltimore so that, that I in Haifa can fix it. Because it's then a team as opposed to it's his problem. It's not his problem. When the products can't get into the United States because FDA decides to issue a warning letter, or if it's a foreign company, they won't allow products in by just issuing an import alert, which is very easy for FDA. You've got a lot of Israeli clients where FDA just hits a button with customs, product doesn't get in. That's very easy. They don't have to go to court. So now it affects the company. And now it's no longer just about one site. Now the company's in trouble. And then FDA will go to other sites. So it's, it was shocking to This was a publicly traded multinational company, and their feeling was, why would I share my dirty laundry with somebody? Because it's not about you. Document decisions, but keep it simple, stupid. Again, we all know FDA's mantra, you know, if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. You know, if a tree falls in the My son has actually told me that if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around, he's convinced me that it doesn't make a sound. My 10-year-old son was, was telling me about the auditory issues and the wavelengths. So I'm taking his word. So the, the age-old question, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? My 10-year-old has said, no. 
Okay, so I've answered that question. Um, FDA says if it don't document it, it didn't occur. Give yourself credit for what you've done. Again, FDA may say, well, you didn't do something. You might have done it. You may not have done it well, but you did it. There's a big difference. To say I didn't document something is saying I didn't document. I didn't meet certain regulations. I have to document certain things. I have to keep records of certain things. I have to report certain things. That's a violation of law if I don't do certain things. Now, I may not have done it well, and that may be a violation, but there's two differences. One is I didn't do it all, and one was I just didn't do it well. Or I, or I did it, I thought I did it well, obviously it wasn't good enough. And I think it's important to give yourself credit for that. I did do training. I did document. I did have it available. Now, it may not have been the way FDA wanted it, so I can improve. It may not have, the SOP may not have been as clear as it could have been, but I had an SOP. It may have been a confusing SOP in hindsight, but I had an SOP. I followed it, maybe I didn't follow it as well as I should have, but I did try. That's a different FDA than I just didn't do it at all. Now, on the other hand, don't give yourself too much credit because you got a 43. You obviously weren't perfect. Because no one likes a braggart, and the enforcement action shows you weren't in compliance. So you're walking a fine line by trying to have a, a clear record, which is, I did do certain things. I can improve. But let's be clear. I, w I wasn't out of control. Because that's the biggest fear that FDA has. When FDA does import alerts or clinical holds or warning letters, that's when FDA is said you're out of control. And now we're telling the CEO or we're stopping your product from coming in because we don't know what else to tell you. And you never want to be out of control. So you're seeing the big, big picture and you're reading between the lines. Again, have proactive timelines. Have reasonable timelines. Again, the company that says, I can fix 15 observations in a week is deluding themselves. They're either liars or they're deluding themselves. I'm not talking about silly stuff. I mean, I guess it's possible. I'm throwing out random numbers. But, but obviously, it's not a matter of, I'll just tell FDA what they want to hear. Because FDA is going to expect that you follow through. They will do a reinspection. They will expect certain things to be done. And so you want to build that credibility with FDA. Don't promise what you can't deliver. If you promise something, you better deliver. Give yourself some flexibility with SOPs. A lot of companies make the mistake. That's all right. Sorry. That's all right. If it's my wife, tell her I'm, I, I you know. um, Give yourself some flexibility. A lot of companies end up making a mistake because they bind themselves too hard. They actually imposed more requirements than they had to. Or they had, or they had SOP after SOP, and they were doomed to fail. You need a three hall, you know, you have, before you can do something, you have to have five signatures. Well, you, didn't, you only had four signatures. Well, there's no requirement in the law that says you have to have five signatures. But my SOP said I had to have four signatures, and FDA says, I don't see a fifth signature. Well, that wasn't required by law. Well, your SOP said you're going to have it, so you didn't follow your own SOPs, which is a violation that you weren't following your own rules. So, at, so I'm not saying do the minimum, but be careful about doing more than you have to do. And again, with the, with the deadlines, don't overpromise because you, if you miss it, now FDA is saying either they don't get it and I don't know what else, what else they don't get. And at that point, I, I remember talking to a compliance officer. He says, I don't know if your client is sly like a fox or stupid. Either way, we don't like him. <laughs> Ellen, mm -hmm. just a second. I uh, just want to have a little bit of time in yeah. it, Yeah, yeah, I'm And uh, I would like also to see if uh, some people might have questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, Five minutes. OK, so it's about five minutes. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. OK, haste can make waste again. Consider requesting a meeting with the FDA district office. If it's a compliance issue, like an enforcement inspectional issue, now obviously in Israel, it's difficult. You don't have a post here, but you can meet with White Oak in, you know, in Maryland um, or have a phone call. Ask yourself whether or not you need to bring the matter to FDA headquarters. Again, most ex-US companies will be dealing with headquarters because you don't have district offices. Um, there's not a Middle East post, and probably for political reasons, they're probably won't be anytime soon. Um, prepare for follow-up inspections, especially if a warning letter has been received. Again, convey commitment to compliance. Consider what resources and commitments would be involved if you sign a consent decree. Now, that sounds harsh, but what I'm doing here is I'm saying, 
if things really, really, really went off the rails, what would FDA make me do? Well, they would say probably I have to hire consultants. They probably would tell me I have to stop shipping. They probably would tell me I'm not going to get my products approved anytime soon. They probably would tell me I have to submit audit reports monthly or quarterly. So for that, I'll put myself on double secret probation. I'll put myself on a proactive preemptive consent decree. We actually did that once with the company. They had two warning letters. They, they were about to fail a third, and we basically told FDA, you know what? We're not going to ship any more products in that particular facility. And that, and that was huge because it was a lot of money. But basically, FDA said, you know what? We can't, we're not going to enjoin you because you basically told us voluntarily you're not going to do that. And you've accepted that you're, we're not going to approve any of your products. And you know that. And you've told us that. So we don't have to tell you. So we don't have to go to court to get the court to say that because you voluntarily done it. So again, I'm not suggesting all the time to think worst, worst case because not everything will rise to that level. But as situations are getting worse, do ask yourself, what would I do if things really, really got bad? And maybe now is the time to do it proactively. Seek clarification and understand the issues. Read between the lines. Have a neutral advisor review and offer suggestions for the next steps of resolution. The ombudsman is kind of a facilitator or a mediator. They are part of FDA, so they're FDA employed. But their role is when the process breaks down. If you're not hearing from the review division, if you're getting inconsistent messages from the review division, if the compliance officer, if the compliance division is not giving you accurate information, you're not getting a response in a timely manner, the ombudsman may be able to move the process along. They're not scientific, it's not substantive, but it's process oriented. There's also an appeals process in certain circumstances, and there are external resources that you can look to. Okay, so last few slides. Enhancing your relationship with FDA, you should understand and adhere to acceptable conventions when communicating with FDA. Okay? Dealing with FDA is just like anybody else. Your internal dynamics at FDA, respect FDA. I know many people by first name, I've dealt with them for 20 years. I go to an FDA meeting, I'm wearing a tie, and they're Mr. Ms. Doctor. I had a client once who kept referring to the compliance officer as still, okay? And then when FDA said, we want to get a response from you in 10 days, and I, I can't make this up, the guy said, Phil, that's going to be a problem. I'm going duck hunting next week, okay? <laughs> before the compliance, before Phil Campbell could get up and tear the guy's throat out, I said, Mr. Campbell, we will get you an answer next week. It has been 20 years since that occurred. Phil Campbell, who I see every so often, says, how's your duck hunting friend doing? Okay? <laughs> so, I said he's in Florida stock selling time shows. Okay? So be respectful. Understand FDA's priorities and resource limitations. Expect the unexpected. It's Murphy's Law. Be cognizant of the appropriate regulatory pathway and have a frank discussion and openness with FDA. Again, put your cards on the table. Be honest. Then they'll be honest with you. Don't waste FDA's time. If you're not ready, don't get the meeting. If you're not ready, don't ask FDA to do an inspection. Okay? Or if FDA calls you up because of foreign inspections, they'll call you in advance. If you're not ready, I mean, if it's a PMA or 510K, you need to get it cleared. That's a business call. But don't waste their time. Look at precedents, past decisions. Don't make FDA think too hard. Don't <coughs> anticipate FDA questions. Out of the chain of command. Minimize unproductive venting. We've talked about that. Have a rhyme of reasons where you need disagree. And be prepared to distinguish your product from other products if this is a point of contention. Quick story, and then I'll take some questions. We, um, we live in a subdivision not far from uh, our shul, and they were all built at the same time. Uh, it was about 20 houses. We're the second owners of the house. We noticed that people were getting their roofs redone. And I told my, about 15 years in, and I told my wife, we're gonna have to get our roof redone. And she said, why? And I says, well, so-and-so got their house redone, so-and-so got their house redone. Everyone was getting it. Now there's one person on the street who did not use the developer. My aunt and uncle. They bought the developer out, they didn't like the developer, they bought it out, gave him his profit, and used someone else. We had some hail, we had some wind, we had bad storms. Everyone was getting their roof redone. I told my wife, we have to get our roof redone. Why else? Did the Malach Hamamas pass over our house? Did the, did the wind and sleet and, and all that pass over our house? No, it hit our house like everyone else. And it was the same materials, it was the same crappy design, and the only one on the street who could possibly say his house is different, Manish Tanah, is my aunt and uncle, who said they used a different developer, better materials, better quality, so that maybe they don't have to get their roof done, they can distinguish themselves. But I can't distinguish myself, I'm like everybody else. The, the, the snow and the sleet didn't, cover, didn't pass my house. So, there's a, so my, my uncle can make a difference, can say why he disagrees that he doesn't have to get his roof redone. If, I, if my product is different from everybody else, and I can explain that, bonus points, but it might be 
I am like everybody else. I'm no different. And get over that. You might be, you might be just like everybody else, and you're going to have to get over that. Rules for negotiating. Put yourself in FDA's position. Listen to care, carefully to FDA. We've talked about action plans. Don't play hardball, but don't be too soft. Ask, the, ask yourselves, the, the, you know, understand the big picture. I would always ask, what ifs? I always ask the worst case scenarios. What's the worst that could happen? I always, that's me. I'm the lawyer. I'm the, I always think, you know, glass half empty. Be responsive, flexible, follow through on commitments, gain FDA's trust. Even if you and FDA disagree, there's a mutual respect and trust you'll get farther with FDA. FDA can be open-minded to good scientific arguments, particularly if there's significant public benefit. High level of confidence in the company's abilities, that's where credibility is key. You provide clinical data as applicable. FDA is expecting such data more frequently. Check your assumption and know your weaknesses. Be a healthy skeptic and avoid the beautiful baby syndrome. Look at FDA's responses and actions on similar products, that is the precedence. Uh, and then I think it's the last slide. Minimize surprises. Establish a reasonable timetable for regulatory approval. Assign sufficient resources to do the job. Hire the right advisors, consultants, and consider singles and playing base to base or aim for the home run. What I mean by that is that a lot of companies will aim for the big claim. I want the whole enchilada, because if I do that, I get big sales, I get bought out, I get the big deal with the partner. But if you want more, expect the FDA to want more. Similarly, if you say, so is it better for me, if I get the home run, God bless, I hit the lottery. But not, not always hit the lottery. Is it better to get in the game, and then I'm making some sales? That's why a lot of companies go to see, get a CE mark. Rather than FDA. So get in the game, get some sales, and then if I want to go for another game, do another 510 game. And use my own as the predicate. Or if it's a PMA, I do a supplement. At least I'm in the game. Now, I'm not saying you've got to do base to base with my approach, but it's something to think about the home run versus the base to base. Okay? Jesus, I have more. Um, how to deal with setbacks. <laughs> Define the points of disagreement. Have you met the regulatory requirements of science? Okay, you can read this. Uh, tactics that may backfire. Okay, oh, let me do the last one. So, tactics that may backfire. Evasion. Okay, okay. <laughs> tactics that can backfire. Evasion, dishonesty, unrealistic expectations, submitting poorly organized or sloppy, sloppy documents, and failing to maintain operational plan. Okay, now I'm done. Okay, so any questions? Yes. I'm a software guy in the more mobile applications. I'm not the only one who, who like a FDA approval for a mobile app. And there is a draft from the end of March 2011 and uh, some document, I, su I suppose, at uh, 2090 or something, <laughs> just <Yeah. laughs> being finished. Right. Um, what do you suggest? Because you don't really know what they, they, they are just drafting and the, I'm not right. sure they, they know what they want. Well, and they probably don't. And so you can look at it. Here's how you make lemonade out of, out of lemon. So the downside is I don't know what they want. And it's a draft guidance. And as you say, they may not know what they want. Another way to look at it is if I've got a good product and I can show the benefit and how I can de define that it's safe and effective, they may say, that works for me. They may be looking for help to, to figure out how do we draw the lines? What do we do? Now, that's one way. The other way is they have, it, they have cleared a couple of apps. Okay, so you can look at that and say, okay, well, what lessons can I learn? Now, by the way, there's some situations you're assuming that it may even require a device uh, clearance. There may be the app that it doesn't even qualify as a medical device. So first and foremost, am I even a device? Because if I'm not a medical device, I don't have FDA. I may be a consumer product. But if I start making certain claims and certain technology and all that, then I find, so first question is, am I a device? Then if I am a device, how do I get FDA to sign off? Are there any precedents? If there's no precedents in the app space, are there precedents in the software where there are packs? Okay, there's, there's archivals, there's picture archiving, there's a guidance document there, there's products that have been cleared, there's software that's been cleared. Can I make analogies there? Oh, and, and if none of these things apply, well, I'm coming up with something that's different, not novel, but something that's different, and here's how I can, here's how I can address your concerns. And in some ways, you may actually help FDA, because now FDA looks good, they signed off on this creative product, and yet you've helped them, you've gotten them out of their box by anticipating their concerns. Okay? Yeah? Just a curiosity. Yes. Uh, we are all from the medical side of the house. Yeah. Do they have a similar branch or division that deals with food? Yes. 
There's a there's medical center for devices and radiological health unit with medical devices. Drugs is a center for drug evaluation and research. There's a biologics group, Center for Biologics and Evaluation and Research. There is the Center for Veterinary Medicine. And then there is a CIFSAN, Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Interestingly, the cosmetic group is in the food group. Because I guess maybe people eat it now. Because they don't know where to put them. First of all, cosmetics are so lightly regulated, except the claims and safety of ingredients. But does every food need approval? No, foods typically don't need approval unless, well, it's a great, the ingredient has to be safe Okay, so either it has to be generally recognized as safe, or if it's a food added, it has to be a regulation. If FDA, if the ingredient has not been shown to be safe or use safe, then there could be a question. So certain food additives, where they've not been generally recognized as safe, you would actually supply data to FDA to get that food additive approved. But as a general rule, foods do not require free approval. Dietary supplements, which are subsets of foods, don't require FDA prior approval. But the ingredients have to be safe. Medical foods are part of foods, they don't require FDA prior approval. The only things that by law require approval or clearance, drug, device, um, and biologic, which is licensure, unless the ingredient is not safe and then it requires some sort of approval. There's also now a center, a tobacco center at FDA, where they've actually taken a lot of personnel from a lot of the other divisions because Obama made that a big, big push. Yeah. Oh, well, 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 well. There's also an office of combination products that deals with drug device biologic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two questions about how big is the uh, FDA. First, they have now a new set of uh, warning letters just by reviewing the website. Mm -hmm. A lot of warning letters are coming because of new branding. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually you don't get a question, you get a warning letter. Right. And then you have to do The second question is dealing with FDA when there is an issue with uh, a product that was market uh, based on what people later to find, right. which FDA does not necessarily agree with you, and the interpretation of the guidelines can be really different from uh, any uh, reviewer. So how you deal with FDA once you get it? Okay, so the first one about the warning letters with the websites. You're right. Rare it's typically what I would call fly-by-night companies that get those letters. It's the dietary supplement companies that make drug claims, or it's the, you know, the sexual, uh, you know, erection type, you know, the, the, the outside stuff, the tobacco company, the, 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 the fly-by-night internet company who's going to sell you tobacco products on the internet. It's rarely, now, there are some situations because of advertising and promotion, they may send a letter to a company. But more times than not, it's the, the warning letters they go because of, those labeling claims are the fly-by-nights. It's, it's an internet-only company, marketing company, and they typically send out like, they call them cyber letters sometimes. They'll send out like 15, you know, to Canadian pharmacies, 15 to shark cartilage companies that are making drug claims or whatever. But there are some companies, reputable companies, that get an enforcement letter because of an advertising promotion. Rarely is the w website the only reason. It's typically there was marketing materials, there was a trade show, and we looked at your website. So one good thing that I would recommend to any company that's doing anything in advertising promotion, marketing, and if that's the part of your job and regulatory, is to review the website. Because that's the first place FDA will look. Because they'll say, it couldn't have been a random sales rep who made this statement if on their website they're making the statement. So the company that says, well, that was a random person who did it, that's not company policy, and yet you're making the claim on the website, then it's obviously a corporate company decision. So, I would always do, and we have done, you know, basically review websites for companies to make sure there's no problematic claims. That minimizes that risk. As it relates to the member, or members of the file or, or letters to the file, listen, people can agree to disagree. Um, I think that letters to the file, if FDA is going to send you a letter or a site you want to forward you for a letter to the file, you take that lump then and there. Then what you try to do is to say, the letter of the file was, you then, your response tries to indicate the letter of the file was acceptable. Because the investigator, the 483, you know, is the investigator's personal observations. It's not the final agency action. So if they differ with Avi, that doesn't mean that the investigator's supervisor disagrees with Avi. It just means that, now, 
they're likely going to side with their subordinate, but at least you've now explained now. It's better to have a member of the file than not have anything. Because if you don't have anything, then you're just sort of like, well, I made it up for, well, because it was Monday. Okay? And, you know, I had to. The member of the file may minimize the damage. But you sometimes can win the day on a member of the file. But if they've already cited you for it, it's going to be difficult. It's sort of like saying, I don't think I was speeding. And the officer says, well, I got to speed. So then the question is, well, but I did have my seatbelt on, and I wasn't texting, and I wasn't smoking a joint at the time. Um, so don't throw the book at me. So that's sort of how you, you deal with it. Your response basically indicates why you think the memo of the file is appropriate. You cite a chapter and verse. You reviewed it internally. You discussed it internally. You maybe even sought outside assistance. You maybe even spoke to FDA about it. And in good faith, that was your position. But I've also seen members of the file go, crap, pardon me. They were basically, we looked at the issue, we decided not to recall. Al Minsk, David, whatever. Well, that's, that's a BS response, okay? That's a, I'm right because I'm right, and I hope they don't challenge me on it. Okay, that's because I don't really have a good answer, but my CEO has told me I better do a member of the file. Or a CYA, okay? Um, so, you know, I think it comes down to the quality of the member of the file. But if it's a good member of the file, then I think your, the, your approach is to reiterate that as it's going up the chain. And you may lose at the end of the day, but what you've told FDA is they're a reputable company. We may disagree with them, but we're probably not going to throw the book at them. I think the lesson then to be learned is maybe I can't do a member of the file anymore. Maybe, maybe I've learned in this situation a member of the file is not going to be appropriate. I may have to do a new 510K or I may have to report or whatever it may be. And I may disagree with that position, but that seems to be the position. The police officer thinks that's, that I was speeding, so I probably need to be careful that I don't do it another time. Those would be some of my suggestions. Is there any uh, new approach regarding uh, electronic records and FDA like getting them more advanced as far as like working with databases of customers' data, working with things that will help them to communicate as well as to control, as well as to uh, audit information. Is there anything on their end that is such as uh, working on that direction, or FDA will always prefer or remain, not always, but you know, favor of the paper. Or favor no, of no, the FDA is clearly heading more towards electronic. I mean, electronic listing, electronic filings. Um, they clear, they're okay with Part 11 so long as. Now, of course, they have the guidance, they took back the guidance. I think that they were almost a little bit ahead of their time when they started out when Paul Chapman started this. I think it was Paul Chapman's was the big guy um, who tried it you know, years ago. Um, and they did all the training and all that, and I think they just weren't ready. They're still not quite ready, even with the electronic listing. They're still having a lot of problems with, I mean, we've had it with a lot of Israeli companies with certain filings that their computer software doesn't match. And FDA's edge as well, that's your problem, not ours. Um, but, so they're still working that through. FDA is clearly going more towards an electronic model. Um, I don't think FDA is ever gonna come out and be ahead of the curve on how you do it, um, you know, how you keep certain records as much as this is the bottom line. We expect the following information. If you can get that done electronically, great. But I do think that they are going more towards at least proactive submissions and listing that is more in the electronic uh, way. Even with samples and things along those lines, they're going more towards electronic uh, record keeping. It's simpler, uh, you know, it's simpler. Um, they're getting more comfortable with it. Technology's improved. They've improved, but they're still not where they need to be, and they would tell you that. The industry is ahead of them in that respect, but they, they do want to go there. I think they're not quite sure how to get there, and I think they would be open to industry helping them. I know that they've used outside consultants and things like that to try that. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. to mention just now, the, the mandate to yeah. these submissions. Right. So right. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's another, it's a great example. They're, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. The what? The e-submissions. There is an e-submission for medical devices. I know you have pharma, to. but uh, you have to. But that's, that actually refers to what the documents are not true papers that are electronically signed you have to and submit CD. Mm -hmm. CD. Yeah. But the content of the documents is still in the document. The content, the traceable elements, the things that are you know part of the guidance. For your development life cycle, there are still companies will be reluctant to share their databases. 
Right. Yeah. Right. It's not safe. Yeah. Right. Do you have an experience with preliminary advanced submissions? Preliminary advanced submission. Give me an example. You say for you want to do some study of trials and you talk to them in advance. Oh, like a pre-IDE meeting? Like a pre-IDE meeting? It would be an example. Yeah, I mean, the pre-IDE meeting, uh, investigation of device exemption, the idea is that if you're going to do clinical trials, you might need to get an IDE, which is permission from FDA to ship uh, unapproved investigational project across state lines in order to do a study, so that's an IDE. Um, a pre-IDE meeting is basically before I start the study, I'd like to get some guidance from you. Now, you don't want to go to FDA and say, tell me what to do. A, they won't tell you uh, everything, and B, they'll say, they'll, they'll, but whatever they will tell you, it will be more than you want to do. Okay? So what you do with the pre-IDE meetings, some of the points I made before, is you want to come up with a game plan. You would say, I plan to do 50 patients. I plan to do, and I plan to do it in these centers. And I plan to look at this, and this will be the endpoint, and these will be the clinical investigators, and this will be the proposed dedication, and this will be the informed consent, and this will be the IRB review, in essence. But yet I would still like to know if this is acceptable. Um, if it's a drug product, you might be asking, is a 505V2 drug application an appropriate pathway? Might I get exclusivity? Um, that would be, what you do is you submit what you propose to do, and then frequently there will be questions that you will ask Typically, we're talking, you know, five to ten questions. I think when you start getting into 20 questions, you're pushing your luck. Um, but if you can get to, you know, a, a reasonable number of questions, am I on the right page, basically? And FDA will say, we agree with you. Sometimes it's yes, you know, is this acceptable? Yes. Sometimes it's yes, if you do the following things, but please keep in mind. Sometimes it will be, no, we disagree with you. You will need to do the following. And sometimes it will be, we don't know, you'll have to submit the data and then we can give you guidance later on. Are there any disadvantages to taking this part? Or, um, no, there's, there's, I mean, sometimes you almost need to. I mean, because you don't want to, well, the disadvantage is you may hear something you don't want to hear, but the advantage, obviously, mm -hmm. is that when you start to communicate with FDA, okay. so you're trying to reduce the surprises. Mm -hmm. um, the, the downside of, of a pre id meeting is not being prepared and then getting more than you expected. Is it really? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, and they are not bound to their export. And they're not bound to, if, his, he makes a good point. And they're not bound, no, actually I didn't know she was gone in this case. Because I mean she's here. Sounds like people change between the I3ID and... Well, right, it, it, right the, the point that he was making, which is a good point, which I want to make, is they're not bound by it, too. Mm -hmm. See, what, ha what FD has the beauty, and this, uh, this I will, not in their defense, but in their defense, things change, okay? People change, data changes, your, your proposal sometimes changes. So they're basically saying, at this point in time, this is our best advice. But just like if, if you had a colleague who said, and I don't know, you're going to forgive me, but you know, they said, what are your thoughts? Well, based on what you told me, here's my opinion. Would it Two weeks later, I got some new information. Well, I might give you a different answer. Or I might say, well, I don't have enough information. Get me more information, and I'll give you more of an opinion. Now, that's giving FDA uh, the benefit of the doubt. The negative is that FDA sometimes doesn't know what the answer is, okay? And they don't want to be bound because they don't want to feel as though they're stuck. So FDA reserves the right to, pardon my language, screw you at any point, okay? Yeah. So they reserve the right to screw you at any point, pardon my language, to, to pull the rug from underneath you. But the pre-IDE meeting, I think, is useful for a couple of reasons. One is it's an opportunity now to face-to-face with the people who are going to ultimately review your application. So you're showing FDA, I know you're a king, and I know I'm going to have to deal with you, and I want to start off on a good, good faith. I, I want to have a communication with you. I want to do this right. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. That's one. Two is, you may actually give me some guidance. By asking you, you may tell me, no, that's not going to work. That saves me a lot of time and money, or that might work, which may give me some benefit, or you need to think about something else, and I didn't think about that. So, you may get guidance there. The downside, of course, is that FDA rejects your entire plan, okay, or requires much more than you wanted to do. My counter to that would be they, would, they were going to do that anyway. If they didn't like your plan, eventually they're not going to like your plan. They're just telling you it earlier than later. So to some extent, I'd almost prefer to know I'm not on the right path. And then I can have discussions about, well, why do you think I'm not on the right path? So I would typically 
once you get such a meeting. Now, FDA won't give you a lot of those kinds of meetings. And in some cases, there's only certain points in the process where they will give you those kinds of meetings. You can't just say every month, hey, can we have a standing phone call with you? Okay, it won't work that way. Okay, there will have to be reasons for it. And sometimes FDA will say, we won't take your email question. You will have to request in writing a formal request, and then we might have to give you, and then we'll see if we give you a meeting. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm happy to stay for a couple more minutes, but I want to make sure. I know it's late, and you may want to say. I you want to say. Last week. Where are you going? Any slide from you? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I've given it to him. So okay. So, so first of all, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I appreciate your arrival here. Sure. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you. You've done a great work for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. This was our first meeting, and um, we're going to have both the presentation on our website as well as the video recording on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to go back there. And uh, of course, Alan, we can uh, open your, your contact information as well. So you may contact Alan if you wish for. And um, open just communication with your wife. <laughs> I need to see that video first. I didn't sign a release, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're private, you can watch it on the way. I don't know if it was in the Ketuba. I had to check the Ketuba again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and hope to see you again on our next meeting. Okay? Thank you very much. For Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.